Hello and welcome. If you have been following developments with leadership and governance across Africa in the last few years, then you would agree that politics is not for the faint-hearted and being in the opposition is often not the best position. Events in the last seven days continue to ensure the need for Africans to re-evaluate and reflect on the essence of democracy and the impact of leadership. This is Africa This Week and I'm your guide, Fadisha Lashotingwe. We start off the day with earlier in the week. Welcome on board. On Monday, special courts in Zimbabwe were set up around the country to deal with cases of political violence and intimidation ahead of elections, which are due in July. These will be the first polls since Robert Mugabe was forced to step down as president last November. Mr Mugabe's former ally, President Emerson Inangagwa, the current president, has pledged to hold a peaceful, fair vote. Previous elections were marred by violence as the police and the military were used to intimidate the opposition to keep Mr Mugabe in power. Still on Monday, thousands of demonstrators took to the streets of Madagascar's capital, Antananarivo, two days after a similar protest was broken up by the police, leaving two people dead and several others seriously injured. The protesters carried the victims coughing to a public square where they continued to denounce new electoral laws. Supporters of the opposition politician and former president, Mark Ravalo Manana, says the legislation aims to block him from running in this year's elections. Still on Monday, thousands of nurses returned to work in Zimbabwe despite their demands not being met. More than 15,000 embarked on a strike last week, complaining of poor pay and a lack of medicines in the state-run health sector. Vice President Constantino Chiwenga, the former army chief who was central to ousting long-serving ruler Robert Mugabe last year, retaliated by sacking them in the interest of patients and of saving lives. Enoch Dongo, spokesman for the Zimbabwe Nurses Association, said that the nurses have gone back to work, although their grievances still stand. And on Tuesday, the Israeli government told the Supreme Court that it no longer plans to forcibly deport thousands of migrants to a third country. The country's previous plan was to deport thousands of mostly Eritrean and Sudanese men to a third country against their will. The fate of more than 30,000 migrants who entered the country illegally from Egypt several years ago has been a hugely contentious issue. They said they fled danger at home and that it is not safe to return to another African country. But Israel considers the majority of African asylum seekers to be economic migrants. French police questioned billionaire Vincent Bolloré on Tuesday over allegations that his group Bollory worked on the election campaigns of presidential candidates in Africa in return for lucrative port contracts. Group Bollory said its African business interests were under investigation. It added it will cooperate with the investigation and denied any wrongdoing. The probe is related to the billing of its communication services in Guinea and Togo, between 2009 and 2010. Police had up to 48 hours to investigate Bollery, after which a judge may have been asked whether there are grounds for a formal investigation, the next step towards a possible trial to be launched. On Wednesday, the Red Cross in Kenya said floods in the center of the country forced more than 200,000 people to flee their homes. The aid organization said the situation is dire and with heavy rainfall persisting, the floodwaters will continue to pose a risk to thousands more across the country. Many roads were submerged and impassable. 
The state-owned power company, said the Kiambere Dam, northeast of the capital Nairobi, is overflowing. It has asked people living downstream to evacuate their homes. Still on Wednesday, Congolese opposition leader Felix Shisikedi rejected suggestions that he might do a deal with President Joseph Kabila. Shisikedi, who was appointed as leader of the Union for Democracy and Social Progress, the UDPS, last month, is one of two main figures expected to seek to run in the election. But he has dismissed speculation he might accept the post of prime minister, something Kabila has offered in the past to appease opponents. Still on Wednesday, more than 2,000 South African Union members marched in Johannesburg in a nationwide protest against the proposed national minimum wage, presenting a test for new president Cyril Ramaphosa, who champions the policy. More than 2,000 South African Union members marched in Johannesburg in a nationwide protest against the proposed national minimum wage, presenting a test for new president Cyril Ramaphosa, who surpassed the policy. The new president, who replaced Jacob Zuma as president in February, has staked his reputation on revising the stuttering economy and rooting out corruption associated with Zuma's nine scandal-plagued years in power. Uh, it is important for the workers to march today to, to show the government that we reject the 29 minimum wage that they are putting on the table. We see it as an insult to the working class. We are not for the capitalist agenda because they want to exploit our workers. <laughs> The protests are the second major public show of discontent in South Africa within a week. Ramaphosa last week cut short a visit to a Commonwealth summit in Britain a day earlier to travel to the northwest province where crowds have been protesting against poor public services. On Thursday, 10 aid workers went missing near the town of Ye in South Sudan. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs said the group made up of staff from different agencies were on their way to conduct an assessment of humanitarian needs. The missing individuals were reported to be staff of the UN and other organizations. A senior UN official in South Sudan, Alain Nudehu, said their whereabouts and condition were not known. He demanded their immediate release a suggestion that they had been seized, but gave no indication of who would have been behind the disappearances. The government forces and rebel factions are present around the region where the aid workers went missing. Part of the fighting that has continued in South Sudan, despite several peace agreements. This is the second incident of its kind in the country involving aid workers this month. On Friday, the Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed said he is taking steps to introduce a two-term limit for the office of Premier. The constitution currently allows for unlimited terms. This is the latest in a number of reforms promised by Mr Abiy, although a state of emergency remains in place. His predecessor, Haile Melrem Dessalain, resigned unexpectedly in February following three years of opposition protests. Mr. Abiy comes from the country's biggest ethnic group, the Oromo, which has long complained of marginalization. Still on Friday, seven people were killed after a train collided with a truck on a rail crossing in South Africa's Cape Town. All seven of the victims were traveling in the truck and none of the rail commuters were injured. However, some train staff are receiving medical attention. Traffic services and police who were on the scene told local reporters that the accident was a human error as the truck's driver ignored railway signals before crossing. South Africa has the continent's largest railway network, but it has been plagued by mismanagement and underinvestment that has seen train use dwindle despite being the cheapest form of public transportation. And with that, we have come to the end of earlier in the week. Up next is Digging Deep, but that will be after the break. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Africa This Week. From past struggles to present-day discontent, history has shown that South Africa is largely made up of citizens with strong views on economy and politics. The Rainbow Nation is arguably the only place in Africa with a dry season, a wet season and a strike season. When the country begins to literally boil over with industrial action affecting key sectors of the economy and possibly the entire civil service. Now, joining me to dig deep on Africa this week is Jendele Humbo, a researcher and African affairs analyst based in South Africa. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Now, what are your thoughts on developments in South Africa as thousands of protesters troop to the streets protesting the newly proposed minimum living wage? Yeah, thank you very much. The, the question of the minimum wage uh, has been on the cards for quite some time. Uh, it's not just coming up uh, because um, questions have been raised about what um, they, they call the question of the living wage uh, in South Africa. Uh, at the moment, the people in uh, far, far below, uh, you can find that even in the mining sector, mm. people earn as, as low as uh, 3,000 rand per, per month, uh, which is barely enough to take care of their needs when you consider the cost of living uh, in that country. And so the demand for was a living wage of 12,500 uh, rand uh, has been on the cast for, 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 for a while. Uh, the interesting thing is that this is also coming at, at a time uh, when preparations are being made uh, for 2019, which is South Africa's election year. Um, having said that, uh, the EFF, uh, which is uh, the, one of the opposition, strong opposition political parties in parliament in South Africa, has also made that a campaign point. Uh, it was a campaign point by the DA uh, in the last election. Uh, but this time around, uh, the, the question of uh, getting a comfortable living for the average worker, especially the mining sector, from where South Africa makes a lot of uh, its income, uh, is, is, is quite crucial. Uh, like you said at the beginning, uh, South Africa is a country of struggles. Uh, the culture of struggles that has, has been built over time uh, mm. is always reflected in the way the people approach issues that have to do with their livelihood, that have to do with their rights, that mm. have to do with uh, their political consciousness. Mm. Uh, don't also forget <laughs> that um, Zueli Zima Vazi, who is now the Secretary of SATU, that is calling this strike, um, was also in Kusatu, uh, which, from which he broke away and formed this union, uh, this new union. Uh, and the reason for that breakaway is because Kusatu is seen uh, not to be strong enough to advance the cause of the average worker in South Africa because it is part of the tripartite alliance uh, that forms the governing ANC. Uh, and so, um, it's, it's, it's quite interesting uh, that SATU, that controls about 800,000 workers, mm. uh, is one calling for the strike. Mm. And you can also see the kind of response that we have seen to the strike. It also shows that uh, as glamorous as South Africa looks, the question of uh, labor wages is still a very crucial thing that they need to deal with. Indeed. The workers, although they, they see the minimum wage proposal as a slap on the face of the working class, what can you make of the policy? Yeah, it's, it's a very interesting policy. I mean, if they're, they're proposing 20 rands per hour, and, and some calculations of that uh, have been made. When we talk about 20 rands per hour, people have said, well, if you, if you, if you, if you work an average of a five working day a week, um, at the end of the day, you're not going to get even up to 5,000 rands per month. And mm. so if the workers are asking for 12,005, and you're giving them barely a third of, of what they're asking for. Uh, but the significant thing again about that is that the new president, Cyril Ramaphosa, was the one who led the negotiations uh, to, 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 to do a minimum wage policy uh, mm. for the country. And so now that he's in power, they throw it back in his face what he had offered them. Yeah. And the point they are trying to make now is to say, look, it means you are not really grounded in the problems of this country. You do not understand the basic needs of the average South African worker. And that's going to be a very crucial thing for him, especially if Cyril Ramaphosa eventually mm. uh, shows, in, shows interest to contest the election to become president of the country in 2019. Mm. And again, that is also going to be another bargaining power uh, for the workers. 
because they might be able to use that to kind of slightly blackmail Ramaphosa uh, to also open up further negotiations about what they have on ground now uh, to say maybe we can do a little bit better. Yeah. But I'm sure that the government is also being cautious because of inflation. Uh, don't forget that the, before the, 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 the before the uh, the new agreement was announced, there had been a little push uh, in, 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 in that from 14 percent to 15 percent. Mm -hmm. And so the workers are also angry. They say, no, look, you you take this thing away at that already, even if you're increasing the wages. But again, companies and other sectors of the economy uh, might also be wary about a very high uh, minimum wage, which can also cause uh, loss of jobs and so on. So it's a very complicated situation. Well, you, just as you have said, it is believed that um, President Ramaphosa is the pioneer of the said policy. How do you think now that this will affect his popularity and that of the ruling ANC as the general elections draw closer? Yeah, I, I mean, the, the, the strikes would uh, definitely uh, likely affect Ramaphosa's um, uh, popularity. But again, there's still an opportunity uh, for both Ramaphosa and the ANC government to manage the situation before, uh, before, uh, before the election, proper election campaigns begin. Uh, I think um, the mining union, which always gives some form of backing to Ramaphosa, might want to come to his rescue a little bit. But how much of that they are able to do depends on what happens between the mining workers union and the larger body of staff too that is being led now uh, by Zveli Zimavari. Uh, Zveli Zimavari is also a political animal. And so we need to uh, think of it in that direction, uh, of what purpose is the strike. Is this an altruistic uh, strike action uh, that is really meant to better the lot of the workers? Of the and when you say that, you also need to look at the party, the political party towards which South African workers are looking more now, are leading. Uh, which is the, the, the Economic uh, Freedom Fighters, the, the EFF. So if you, if, you, if you place those side by side, the interests of SATU and the interests of EFF and the interests of the general opposition in parliament, uh, then the earlier they begin another round of negotiations, perhaps the better for Ramaphosa and for the ANC. Hmm. Well, we have been seeing video footage of people looting and mayhem being perpetrated on the street in the guise of protests. Now, what, in your estimation, how would you assess the security situation in the country? Well, every protest in South Africa has um, always had the tendency of uh, degenerating uh, into looting and some form of, um, of violence. Uh, first and foremost, I think it, it indicates the kind of frustration that you have among the people at the lower level. Secondly, it also shows the porosity of the security network in South Africa. I think after 1994, uh, a lot of things had been relaxed. And so uh, it, it, it appears that um, it's so difficult uh, for even uh, the, the South African police uh, to control crowds during, uh, during protests and rallies and, and so on. But again, don't also forget that the police in South Africa once went on strike uh, for poor pay. And so if you want a police force that is um, able to control the crowd, that is able to, to do things diligently, or you also want people uh, to, to, to you, must, you must be able to then put in place processes uh, that will allow uh, the police to do their job uh, with, with some form of commitment. So at times you see that even on the part of the police, there's not enough commitment. And South Africa is not a country where you can easily uh, invite the military uh, during ordinary protests like this. So it's a place where you want to uh, kind of, on the one hand, uh, allow people the freedom to protest, the freedom to ventilate their views, and at the same time, you want to put them in check. Yeah. But again, that also reminds one of the way the South African authorities react each time uh, there are uh, violent protests which uh, lead to uh, either for people from foreign lands or foreign nationals uh, being attacked and things like that. Once you close your eyes on that, uh, when it happens again among fellow South Africans, it might be difficult for you to control it. And so that's a new, uh, totally a new dimension uh, in, in the protest structure that uh, the South African authorities need to look at critically and try to nip in the past. In the past, one could predict that half of any protest in South Africa would be made up of singing, dancing, jumping, and those kinds of things. But the dynamics are beginning to change. And the, 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 the earlier they begin to look at those dynamics, the better for the authorities and for the people of the country.
Indeed, but in the wake of all of this, President um, Cyril Ramaphosa cut short his engagement at the Commonwealth Summit last week to attend to the uprising in the Northeast province. Now, what advice will you have for the government in an attempt to tackle this problem? Yeah, the, the, the Northwest province is, is, is quite interesting. Um, the, the issues, the issues that, came, that, that brought about um, the, the, the riots in the Northwest are so complicated. Now, but the, the question of uh, corruption in, in, the, in the provincial government and the questions of um, whether uh, it was proper to, for the, 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 the president or the ANC government to take a stance on, on reports about corruption in the provincial government, uh, it's, it's something that could have hand, been handled in a different way. But I'm sure that Ramaphosa himself did not expect that it was going to get that bad. And that was part of the reason why he had to cut short his, his trip uh, to, to the UK uh, to, to come back home to, to, to address this. But again, the, 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 the kind of... Um, the, 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 the parliament is there. Uh, the, the provincial parliament had the power to be able to call uh, either Supra or whoever uh, they, they thought was, was in the wrong to order. But, but, but again, the, the feeling is that there is some kind of cover-up at the level of the powerful league in the ANC. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the province that is almost uh, basically an ANC province, when it erupts like that, it calls for new ways of imagining the problem at hand. It also com calls for new ways of addressing the issues at hand. And, and I guess that's, that's probably why uh, it, 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 it went as far as Damaposa himself having to, to, to come in. But again, that has not even touched with the issues. The, the core issues that people are asking, the questions they're asking about poverty, the questions they're asking about service delivery, the questions they're asking about the minimum wage, and the questions they're also asking about crime uh, have to be addressed uh, if, 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 if the, the, the authorities uh, want to put this kind of thing that day. Well, one would have imagined that with the ouster of um, Jacob Zuma, relative peace will pervade the country. But alas, that isn't so. Jandele Humbo, this is where we're going to have to leave it now. Researcher, an African affairs analyst based in South Africa. Thank you for your time with me. Thank you very much. Well, South Africa finds itself at crossroads as key moments have grown into strong movements, ensuring that the labor force continues to contend with the idea of minimum wage and maximum hardship, where the negotiating table with governments is more or less a revolving door. For Africa to prosper and attain sustainable development, leaders must become responsible and responsive in meeting the plight of the working class, ensuring that the dignity in labor is realized and the potential of industry is maximized. I have been your guide, Fadisha Lashutzingwa. Many thanks for watching and bye for now.